like Deirdre was saying there, this is a cooperative enterprise and I feel that we need more cooperative approaches to our housing. So I want to look at community-led cooperative approaches and a few things that I've seen across Europe because I've been researching this for a little bit and a little bit in junction to where I live now. So I'm currently living in Clog Jordan. Um, I've been involved in the Eco Village since we founded it in 1999, so you can get an idea how long sometimes projects take. We've been living in Clog Jordan for 10 years. Uh, it is a community driven project. We didn't wait for a big European pot of money and develop it. We didn't wait for uh, just a developer to build our houses and for us to move in. We work with our architects, our permaculture designers, and we have developed this ourselves. And I often say it's the longest and most expensive self-development course I've ever taken, because you learn so much about yourself as you have to interact with others. Uh, the Eco Village currently has 55 houses, but it has 130 sites for housing in the plans. And we have been, uh, just well, for a long time now, but most recently, uh, last Saturday, Hugh was with us, Coquilon, and we're, we're exploring going forward for um, some sheltered, affordable uh, housing, um, some social housing, and even some housing for refugees in our estate. Our estate has, when you walk in, uh, it's a little embarrassing, they're eco McMansions, massive houses, all individually, privately owned. And we need to quickly have um, some co-housing in the eco-village. Um, and for me, that co-housing is, what I'm interested in is co-ownership. I want to get the burden of debt off individual shoulders and that we come together to think not of just our individual house, but of a little neighborhood where the debt is shared by us all through a cooperative. And so I'm working on the edges with a Claude Jordan co-housing for a test bed for radical affordability. Um, we've been taking Javi's sort of phrase, looking at 21st century um, Walter Seagal type methods for elements of self-build. So that's on the edges, but hopefully in the next few months we can move forward with Bob Jordan um, with um, Hugh and his team's help and some of the um, Fringer events to make Clock Jordan more accessible for people in low incomes like myself or younger people that just can't raise capital. But I want to talk about co-housing a bit more. So co-housing in a nutshell is uh, where people come and um, they don't have to be all in co-ownership. It's beyond a shared house or a commune. People have their own space with their own kitchen and their own um, bathrooms and everything. But what's always the common thing in co-housing is there's common facilities, whether it's even just a laundry. So rather than if there's 20 units in the co-housing, you have 20 washing machines, you just have one laundry. Or there might be car clubs or carpool. Uh, but most co-housing I've visited would have a function room that would act for community meals, sometimes once a week, sometimes every night, as we'll hear from some of the examples tonight. So I'm going to run through... I went out and visited about 10 across Europe. I'm going to show you about four examples in the time I've got. So Eva Langsmeer in the Netherlands is in the centre of the Netherlands. It's like an eco-village, um, but it's got so many more units. And it's similar to our eco-village in Clock Jordan, which I should have said is a bit of a misnomer when you say eco-village, because we're part of a really um, beautiful heritage village, Clock Jordan. We're an eco-neighbourhood. Similar to Eva Langsmeer, there's a big settlement of about 18,000 people, and there's about 400 people in the eco-development um, or eco-neighbourhood. And what's interesting about Eva Langsmere, every cluster was one architect, one builder, that we could have learned that in the eco-village because we had, we've got 55 houses up, that's 55 architects, 55 builders. Not really, but it's getting close to that. So these are all um, clusters, and this one, which I want to focus on, is co-housing for seniors. So this... Uh, so this uh, is the, the shared courtyard of this. Everyone has their own little unit. Um, they have then facilities that they share up here. So this is all here. So they have shared solar and they've got a little guest room up here for when there's guests so rather than every unit having to have an extra guest bedroom for that time when you've got friends or family coming. They have a guest room that um, 
that uh, you just book when you need it and that sort of thing. And they have a big common room which has beautiful library and kitchen and they can eat there, they can share resources there. They have downstairs, you go in here, they have shared post boxes and again, having something like that builds social capital because rather than the postman going to every single unit, you go to the post box, pick up your mail and you probably have a bit of an interaction with your neighbour. This is Fintorn. Many people know Fintorn. It's one of the oldest eco villages, 50 years old, amazing story. No time for that story tonight though. But they've just developed in the, the, the eco village side of Fintorn, they've built a co housing unit called East Winds. And it has about 40 units, if you keep going. They're really quite attractive. And mm. um, they've all got everything in it two beds, one bed, two bed, three bed, their own kitchen. Um, some are, most of them are owned, only a few of them are part of um, a co-housing, but they've got that shared ownership of common facilities. So a laundry, if we keep going, this is their common living room. Uh, there's a little uh, cubby hole that goes into a kitchen that they serve from that. And they've got a little library and office that is used quite a lot there. So it's a, in a, in a eco-village, which Fintorn is similar to I don't know if anyone's been to Findhorn, but the Field of Dreams there is a bit like uh, Club Jordan Eco Village and um, big dream houses. Um, this one is one of the most interesting, and if anyone's interested in co-housing or group building, because the Vauban has about 6,000 residents, and it was a military base in Freiburg, and um, when the French pulled out, let's go a bit slower, when the French pulled out, they, there was the French uh, military, and they only pulled out in the 90s. I was, I was surprised that Allies were still in Germany for so long. The French pulled out into this massive base. There was a number of these old barrack buildings, and the council, it was, I think, a, a green council or a green local authority, and they put a, a tramway right through the middle. And instead of selling the sites, this is a lot of sites now, 6,000 units, instead of selling them to individuals, they had a scheme there, Bo building, Bo, Bo, I can't remember the, how they say it in Germany. Do you know that, no? Which one? It's like a group building scheme. The I don't know. <laughs> group, group building, we'll say. Um, and what they did was they would encourage people to come together and the council or local authority would give an architect and they would work together to put their units together. So um, when you go into the Vauban, it's, it's, it's got to instantly feel different because they've traffic cammed it and there's lots of big blocks that are some co-housing, some co-housing that are mixed, some co-housing for the elderly and co-housing for the um, disabled. Lots of private housing, but in these shared blocks. So this one's the Susie. These are, this is quite anarchic. So the Susie is one of the there's about six or seven co-housing units in, in, in Vauban, in Freiburg. This one was the big military buildings. And they, I think they've got about 300 residents in blocks, each floor has maybe about six rooms and a big shared kitchen and shared bathrooms. And so everyone has their own space, but not their own kitchens, but they have in clusters of about 10 units, they have their own kitchens. They have downstairs, they've got shared laundries, they've got food stores, um, they've got little play parks in amongst the, there's three or four of these big blocks. And it's all for young students and low income. So if your income goes above a certain level, you have to leave the, the Susie. Uh, so it's mainly students, young people. It's quite a mix, but it's quite anarchic. And then you go down the street and there'll be like a shiny, um, modern, progressive building. So the, the whole place is, is um, quite diverse. So it's still inside the Volk of Oban. This one's closer to home. This is in Lilac. This is Lilac in Leeds, low impact, afford, low impact living, affordable community. And Lilac was the first mutual home ownership scheme that the UK government put together to encourage uh, people to co-own. And the scheme, the, the mutual home ownership scheme that the government have, there's, I, I can't understand it myself because I'm not very good at figures. I need to get Tim to look at it, Hugh. Yeah. Um, but it's a system where you pay your rent as a percentage of your income. So if your, rent, your income goes down, for some reason they've worked out where you pay less rent. Uh, the buildings are made from a system called mod cell. It's like a glue lamb um, fabricated thing with straw bales, and they make it not in a factory, but in offsite, um, and then they bring the would be structurally insulated panels. These these big panels would all be made um, and brought in and clicked together into these units. Um, 
and, and they've got this nuclear green at this picture, but this pond here, uh, they've got all these blocks. So my friend lives in, which where my friend lives in this block here. He has a one bedroom house, but they go up to four bedrooms. They've got, um, this was an old school in Leeds, and actually the Leeds Council made it affordable, similar to you said, they held on to the thing, that they made a, a community land trust, a CLT. And so the CLT um, allowed them to build affordably with a mutual home ownership scheme uh, on top of that. This is their common house, so they've got a shared kitchen and shared um, guest bedrooms and function room in there. And this play area for the kids right in the heart of the neighborhood. So this, similar to a lot of co-housing, it would be like circling the wagons where, where, and round a shared space. And um, some places like Christiania and Denmark is, if you can get out the tourist zone of Christiania, Christiania and Denmark's one of the, it's, it's about 700 people living there in, a, in a, an old military base. But they have lovely pocket neighborhoods that are really safe for kids inside. They're, they're still open, but they're, they're closed, similar to some of these. This one is Stroud, Spring Hill and Stroud. This is one of the earliest eco co-housing. Um, Stroud's really, really progressive. It's got a lovely street. It's a funny site. It's on a hillside, so you come in at the top and then down at the level. It's got a big shared building. So this is the, the shared building. It's a recreation room with like uh, gym and games. Uh, it has an, uh, or a gym and games room, a recreation room with a little cinema. And the top floor is a community kitchen where they have food every <coughs> night. So you, if you want to, only have to cook once every month and a half in the evening. Uh, and you can go in there and get your food in every, every night. So most communities would have this either once a week or like, like Summer Hill every, every, every night. It's available. And if you're not want to be social, you can just ask for it to be left out and you can go pick up and take it to your own house. Okay, that, that is my little presentation to introduce some ideas of cooperative housing or different ways that we might live collaboratively. And we'll have some questions after. So. Thank you very much.